Hello everybody and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today I'm going to be painting a watercolor painting based off of a old photograph. So I should have that old photograph edited so it's right here um, and then I'll have my result right here. And I'm going to be doing this uh, solely in burnt umber, wet and wet. Um, this photograph I got from a Facebook page, Monochromy Past and Present Photography, where people will post either um, current uh, monochrome um, paint, uh, photographs or historical ones, and maybe say who did it and a little blurb about it, etc. Um, this one is by William Fell. It is November 1st, 1914. It's when the uh, first, the troops, carriers carrying Australian and New Zealand soldiers, horses, and supplies for the First World War. That's when they left Albany. Um, that's a little quote on the monochromy page. Uh, no copyright infringement intended. I don't think there is one because it's over 100 years old with the photograph and all that. But um, just kind of throwing that out there. We're using it as a learning device. Uh, okay. So I have my medium hake brush. I saturated um, my paper with water. So I just applied heavily with the large hake brush. It is 11 by 15 Stonehenge Aqua and 100% cotton and 140 pound cold press. And we're just going to use uh, burnt umber for this. I don't know if earlier I accidentally said burnt sienna or not, um, but yeah, burnt umber is what we're going to focus on. And I poured out some just cotton brand right there. Now, my idea and the reason I wanted to do this one is that, first of all, the picture itself is very pretty. Um, it seems like it's almost kind of like a, uh, a tint or whatever. I'm not familiar with um, too many phot photography techniques. I did do quite a lot of darkroom stuff in um, high school and then college. I'd probably just ha maybe have four classes underneath my belt. So maybe that's not quite a lot, but kind of more than the average person with uh, darkroom photography, but that was the simple um, exposing the film or, you know, doing what you needed with the chemicals, using the enlarger um, on the photo paper, etc. There's a whole bunch of other techniques that were used throughout history for, um, for photography. Anyway, so this one, first of all, I found it aesthetically pleasing, but one of the things was is that it's very vast open space. We have a little bit of the carrier ships here, and we have some receding, and then we have the sky. So the sky and the water are the main textural interesting elements. And I was just thinking, how on earth do you paint something like that? And make it exciting where somebody wants to look at it for more than one second. Um, the other thing is, if we went burnt umber, how do we paint in those boats to get that um, recession of those boats? Because they're darker tonally, but I feel like a stronger value of burnt um, umber is gonna put, push it forward in the picture plane. So I'm a little bit at a loss, so I'm gonna experiment with those concepts while I do this. I'm gonna use the paper towel. Um, I just applied the burnt umber wet and wet, wet. And now here it's to try to get a more interesting texture out of this. Um, you want to make sure you don't repeat any stamping patterns. And if you don't like the way something's coming along, you could just stamp right back in with the hake brush, re-wet the area, and come back. That's the good thing about 100% cotton, is that it could stand up to this wet and wet and that back and forth. This 
there's other papers that aren't 100% cotton, but professional grade. And um, you just have to learn your paper in order to uh, really kind of understand what's going on. Where if you're using the Fabriano Studio, um, which is 25% cotton, as you practice with it, you'll, you'll learn what it can handle and what it can't. Just like I use this all the time, the Stonehenge Aqua, that if I was to move over to um, Arches, that there's, there's a difference that I can feel, and I would feel a little off using the Arches. So part of it is using quality paper, and part of it is learning the paper that you're using. There's some areas I didn't touch at all just because I really liked the way that came through. And I want this to kind of be a mid-tone right here like it is in the photograph. Down in the bottom in the water, you can see the crispness of some of it, which is interesting because something I was thinking about was really old timey photography uh, would take a couple of seconds for the photo to take place. So everybody would have to stand still. Uh, the trees would have to stand still, the water would have to stand still for the photographer. Or since you can't get the water to stand still, the water itself would probably seem very smooth in an old-timey photograph because it's been moving for um, whatever time, the duration that you have that exposure set for. Uh, here we do have that crispness, so I'm wondering how much technology had grown by, when is this, uh, 1914, so World War I to be able to do a short exposure to get that crispness of the water. So that's a, just a little personal thought. And I want to be careful of leaving too much of the uh, hake marks there. They, um, that Even though I'm wet and wet, you could kind of see some of those individual strokes. What might help if I put this down, I get a thin piece to try to lift off white lines. I use, um, just in case you're watching internationally, I don't know if this is available overseas or not, but if you go into the automotive section of um, a supermarket, something like that, uh, Walmart, you'll find uh, shop rags, these blue shop rags. I prefer them because of their resilience and um, absorbency, especially when I'm working in oils. My friend Kylie uh, was laughing one day. She was like, that's what my family always got me as gifts, um, the blue shop rags, because you know she did art as well and she enjoyed using it for uh for art purposes also during the um i know we're still in a pandemic um where things are at right now i'm not sure worldwide but whenever things got bad in america we had a lot of, um, you know, toilet paper, paper towels that were sold out um, and hard to find. But when you sauntered over to the automotive section, there were these blue towels. 
I didn't use them for you know household purposes but um, you, know, you also go back into the automotive painting section whatnot like house painting section to get gloves and masks too when they were sold out in the health department in the pharmacy okay so here um, I'm still wet in a lot of areas on this painting um, I know I won't be able to get crisp battleships in just yet but I kind of want to start getting the idea in place for two purposes one just so I can kind of start marking them out and where they're gonna be this is the number one rigger let me get stronger just pure pigment and two, uh, the reflections and see if there's any reflections apparent anywhere so I can um, take advantage of the wet and wet at this stage. Like this guy right here, he has a shadow cast. Or a reflection cast. Hopefully we can get that nice and soft, just naturally through the um, the idea of the wet and wet itself. It'll create that illusion for us. Same thing with this uh, big old ship here. Um, somebody on my uh, Patreon page had messaged me. I believe she had recently moved and she was getting back into painting. And um, she was concerned about the large quantities of pigment that she was using. Because um, she, was, she was following up with the videos that I was doing and saying how um, she was, I guess, maybe not able to get the softness and I, I had I responded back and said hello, you know, uh, a very nice message. And um, I thought two things initially when I was writing that message back was that the quantity of pigment might be a personal preference and a kind of a um, demonstration of your your personal hand into the painting and. Second, Percy. We got the cat Percy. Somebody had requested Percy be on film. At least if I can grab her. Percy! Okay. Percy, you can't stand on the painting. But you can come underneath and say hi to everybody. Let's see if we can get her to turn sideways. Nope. She's just going to paste it. There you go. That's Percy. And second, Pigment wise and pigment load, um, some painters will use a very large, heavy approach with the pigment in wet and wet stage. And um, the, um, whatchamacallit, the, the tonal shift that takes place as it dries um, alleviates. The, um, the excessive amount of um, pigment that you put in or or shifts the tonal value down. Um, Ron Ranson in his books will always say in his wet and wet stage people would gasp at the large quantity of um, maybe Payne's gray that he was putting in into the sky. But what is happening that and I've talked about this before I'm taking just a clean brush to pull up some whites here what's happening is the tonal shift the drying shift that's taking place uh, think of wet cement wet black top um, compared to dry cement dry black top how darker it looks 
So kind of the water being in there, the refraction of light taking place going through it, it's um, just making it appear darker uh, in this stage. And then when you dry it off, things lighten up. So don't worry too much about too much pigment is what I'm saying. Lift up a little bit here. I'm just putting water down in a line, um, pure water, and then pressing to lift up to get us those textures here. Uh, to add into the pigment and tonal shift idea, some things do not shift as much when they dry. I've noticed that with mixtures of thalo green and quinacridone rose. And um, Burnt Umber itself doesn't really have too much of a drying shift when it dries. There's a website, handprint.com, where the author goes into extreme, extreme detail into drying shifts of different pigments and the different degrees that they go. And um, uh, whenever I mention handprint.com, I always issue a warning that it is what we call a rabbit hole, where the, there's just so much information on watercolor on there that it just becomes so overwhelming. And then it just starts making you question everything. So uh, you go there with a kind of a warning. Just getting a little idea of the smoke rising from these. I'm using the side of the um, hake, uh, not the hake, the number four, number one rigger for a little bit of these textures. And then softening with that. I also use this to remove water. I could come back and add harsher, darker spots with that pigment there. Um, I do feel sometimes this textural technique, I might push it too far and use it too much. I don't know if I do rely on it, but um, because the scene, I'm only using one pigment and I'm only using we only have the sky and the water. I think I can use it to kind of maintain interest for the viewer. I can soften it if need be. We could also exploit the hake to give us a texture like this, but um, we want to be wary of how far that line would go with it. For example, here's the hake here. That's kind of too wet. I try it out some. So you see the texture that we're starting to get there? I want to be careful of that stamping effect where it just seems repetitive. some darker values here, darker values here. Okay, so let's pause for a dry off. Okay, so we're pretty dry right here. I'm going to grab this 
rigger and then go into these ships, kind of make them a little bit more defined. Um, remember at the beginning, one of the challenges felt like, even though these are darker in tonal value, they're further back in the picture plane, so how do I achieve that? Um, and I don't know if I answered that question that I posed out loud to myself, but, I'm going to paint these guys in and then speculate. So, usually we'll do darker values closer in the picture plane for aerial perspective. And I'm kind of just thinking this out as we speak. So I do remember somebody recently saying and showing in a picture that they'd posted a painting. So, you know, notice the darks in the background that, you know, you can obviously, you know, this is an example of being able to get that recession even though the darks are further back. So I would think that the elements around it would have to play a part in it. Um, meaning, the way we shaped the sky and as we got closer up, our clouds got bigger. As we come closer in the water, we have more detail. Um, using the linear perspective and those other perspective devices would help this one sit in place. I think that would be the answer to it. And um, obviously a lot of fine detail was picked up in this photograph of these ships. a lighter one back here so comparatively this guy being lighter will hopefully help stronger pigment for this one that's closer here. This one sits on a slight angle. Also, interesting fact, the brush that I'm using, the Rigger brush, comes from its original use of painting. The name comes from painting the rigging on ships. I got this. thinking maybe next time something like this even though I used the wet and wet to kind of set everything up and to set up the reflections that one was a little too large and vertically so there might be things I can do to fix in the future There's a little boat right here.
and then we'll see if there's any last minute adjustments we can make, anything we want to play around with. Hopefully, the ultimate goal here, which I've never really explained, was just you know studying monochromy and what we can achieve texture-wise. Stand up for a moment and take a look. Excuse me. I'm going to pause to do a dry off. And standing up looking at it, I realize I want more texture in this foreground, and that'll be the last uh, little tickling aspect. We'll do this texture to help this foreground push forward, create that picture plane where things would then recede backwards, and help those boats sit back. I think if I was to do this scene again, the top right and top left would have stronger concentrations of pigment, it came out darker. Reason being, um, I like the cropping effect. And in the original photograph, we do have that darkness in the top corner of both sides. Also in the bottom left and right, we do have that. And you'll notice that I'm always, I personally just really enjoy that um, location of darker tonal values. I'm just trying to bring that up without It seemed too uh, too forced. See, like right here is where it went darker, and right here. Darker too. So, anyway, on that note, I hope you enjoyed. Um, please let me know uh, down in the comments if you have questions, comments, uh, anything like that. Um, if you ever want to follow along with one of these tutorials, feel free. You're more than welcome to uh, sign your name onto it and uh, turn around and sell it. You have my express permission for any tutorial that I do if you want to follow along. Uh, this one, since it's from a photograph that somebody else took, make sure you just attribute that person that's kind of a whole new realm of of things you know uh so just be wary there um if you want to support the channel i have a link down below to the patreon i also have other ways you can support the channel so i'm gonna sign my name and i'm gonna write after william fell so i will stop it at that i hope you enjoyed and i'll talk to y'all soon have a great day